Yeah, that's great. And we are excited to talk about this because I think just the interest in particularly hybrid and blended and you know remote work management has gotten so much attention these days. And it's not easy. In fact, I was just in an online discussion about this and people saying, you know, we're all trying to figure it out to some degree, but what are those foundational things we can do? And, you know, what can we, how can we really think about this problem that, and I don't know if it's a problem, but that things have changed and that we're probably not going back to where we were two years ago. There's going to be some mix of hybrid involved in working with our clients and our teams. So how do we really optimize that? So we want to start today talking about what some of those challenges are, and then we're really going to get into a framework for setting expectations, managing performance, providing feedback and taking appropriate actions, and then how do we actually improve those skills? How can we implement a program uh, really to help our managers be more effective? So that's where we're headed. We have a lot to talk about on this uh, topic. And Norman would really love to start getting feedback from the audience as we often do. I'd love to hear what challenges they're facing leading their hybrid teams. And you know, I know we hear about it a lot on our sales calls and our training about some of those challenges. What do you think we're gonna hear uh, today, Norman? Well, I think you know some of the challenges that we're gonna have, uh, I think we'll cover some of these in our next slide. But you know, when I think about it, Things have changed dramatically. Obviously, we've all been through a pandemic. Uh, you know, COVID is now here to stay, but probably in a much more manageable form than it was. But the companies, you know, when I think about it, and I think I put in that I'm, you know, calling in today from Seattle, and I just read our local newspaper where we have Amazon and Microsoft. No one's going back completely, and I'm not sure that they ever will. And that's particularly challenging for sales teams because. A lot of companies had inside sales teams. Now those people are distributed. Even if they had outbound sales teams, people are doing a lot less travel. So I think it creates a lot of uh, challenges. And I think we're getting some participation here in our chat. And then I will share a few comments and some of my thoughts, right? After we hear from our participants here. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, Rain mentions connecting on the same level as eyeball to eyeball. And, mm -hmm. you know, that idea is we can't just drop by or we can't go right along with our team uh, you know, the way that maybe we used to or we'd like to. So I think that that's key. Love to hear from others. So what challenges do you see with your managers in this hybrid environment? What are they running into? So we're getting some other ideas. You know, I think we're seeing from Philip reading the vibe in the room. It's really hard when you're not necessarily in the room. You know, people use Zoom, people use Teams. We're trying to make some connection, but, you know, you're not going to get the same level of experience as if particularly if you're doing something like coaching and so one of the big, major areas that we are focusing on now is how do you provide sales coaching to remote teams so i totally agree with philip's comment on reading the vibe in the room yeah absolutely and i think it is you know what one of the things we'll hear and we'll touch on you know it's just do we know what people are doing day in and day out and are mm -hmm. they contributing and then in the way that we would like them to be and maybe it's a little false sense of security where if we had them all together we could see or if we were out with them you know we have that we can touch them we can you know kind of understand what what's happening uh, but we don't have that we feel cut off and at least there's a sense that maybe we don't we don't have an idea so let me share what i think some of the challenges are and obviously if you have additional challenges you want to put in the chat you know let you know continue to participate and we'll try and uh, reference some of those but what I'd like to say is, first of all, raise a point about not necessarily knowing what my team is doing. And this really gets to account, a culture of accountability. You know, we've shown a tremendous amount of empathy during the pandemic. Obviously, people had a lot of personal challenges. Some people had to deal with health challenges. People had to deal with daycare. But at the end of the day, we also want to make sure that we have a culture of accountability. It's very difficult to hit your sales number where people aren't accountable. And I think also with the hybrid world, the, the line between personal and business has blurred. And I think that, you know, quite often just kind of understanding what people's work schedules are, being clear, clear about those work schedules, being clear about, you know, what are the results we expect? What are the activities? We'll spend more time on that as we go through this topic. Digital fatigue is real. I know that for, when this meeting ends, I'm jumping into another meeting. I've already was on one this morning. I think Ray just came off one with a client. So, you know, these back-to-back -back meetings are real. We're all experiencing them. When you come into the uh, today's webinar, you probably came from another activity. We all read about the great resignation. And, you know, during uh, the pandemic, people really 
started to really reevaluate what they wanted to do, what was most important in their lives. And, you know, there's, I think I heard, you know, just a staggering number of job openings. People are moving, people are looking. If you told everyone, well, you have to come back to work a hundred percent, you might lose a few people along the way. So also just uh, organically teams are growing and, you know, it's, it's, the economy is remarkably resilient and strong and companies are hiring. So attracting, retaining sales talent is another area that we're hearing about. Urgent requests, I actually think this went up dramatically. Uh, I can't tell you, we use Microsoft Teams internally. The number of Teams messages I get, even up to one minute before this webinar, and a number of them are marked urgent, need to know, we're working with a, uh, you know, with a client. So we're all getting these urgent requests. And then the topic that we talked about earlier about coaching remote reps when they're, you know, especially I think that comment about reading the room, we're, we're not gonna have that same feeling and we have to have some new strategies related to coaching. So those I think are all challenges, but they're all challenges we've been working through for some period of time, we're getting used to, and we hope the insights we share today will help address some of those challenges. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we, we hear about these and more. And you know, I think Philip mentioned the integration of work-life balance, right? That mm -hmm. it's no longer an either or, but we need to figure that out. But going back to really, well, what are we expecting? Are we getting the results? And in some cases, and I know we've seen this, I think productivity may have improved in a lot of areas, but do we know, are we able to measure, are we able to see, and you know, if we're saving two hours of commute time, um, what does that mean? You know, how are we integrating that? So I think there are, there are a lot of these things that we're all learning to deal with, but let's talk about, you know, the first step we think on how to address this idea of accountability. And it really gets to priorities and expectations and some of the things that we can do to address some of the challenges uh, that, that came up in the chat and, and on that list. And specifically creating this culture of accountability. So, you know, there's a lot that we can do and think about as it relates to, are we getting, you know, are people doing what we're hoping or, or what we're expecting of them? But it starts with having this vision for where we're headed. Does everybody know really what the vision for the sales team, for the organization, what it is we're trying to accomplish? Because what we know is that if people have a reason and kind of filling in that why, they're more likely to lean in and make that extra effort. So communicating the vision, then setting very clear performance expectations. In other words, have we had that communication? Have we laid that out? We'll talk a little bit about how to do that. And then are we monitoring and managing the activities that are gonna produce the results we're looking for? So it's not to say micromanage, we don't need to be looking over their shoulder, but are we seeing the activities that we're hoping so we're not getting to the end of the quarter and saying, well, we missed our number, why did that happen? So we'll get into each of these in a little bit more detail, but we wanna be managing that. We wanna be assessing if there is a performance gap, what's going on there, right? What's the root cause? What's the underlying issue? And then what action can we take to close that gap or to help them out? Maybe it's a training, a coaching, maybe we need to give them more feedback. Maybe there's something that's getting in the way, right? But there are numerous things that may be the cause Oftentimes we just jump to the conclusion and say, well, it's a training issue or they're just not motivated. So I think when we look at this culture of accountability, we really wanna create a performance partnership with our team to say, well, here's what we're trying to do. Here are the things that we wanna look at. Now let's monitor and see if, if we're moving along. Love to get your thoughts on this as well, Norman. Yeah, I think this is a really interesting um, perspective. And when I think about, you know, the bullet points are up here on the chart. If you think about bullet point number one, number two, number three, and number four, those are 100% on the manager. Obviously, the sales activities are shared between the manager and the sales team and addressing the performance gaps. But the culture of accountability absolutely starts with the manager. And I think that this is a great chance for some introspection. Am I doing everything as I need to do as a manager to really create the culture of accountability give everyone the tools they need to be successful and then really work with them. As you said, I love that word performance partnership. We're working together. And I think creating that sense of team in a hybrid world is much more difficult. People are distributed. I know even at SRG, you and I and David were talking yesterday about, you know, how are we going to bring the team together? Can we do it in person periodically? Are the things we can do virtually? So I think making sure we're also creating that sense of teamwork, accountability and empathy and I think coming out post-pandemic, hopefully post-pandemic, 
the accountability is an area we've really got to get back to, especially as we think about coming into 2022 and achieving our sales results. Yeah, and I think the shift that people have realized is it's less about having to see the back of people's heads, right, or, or count the, the hours that they're in the office, and more about are we driving the results, right? Are we really accomplishing the things that we hope to? So with this idea of accountability, what we'd love to do is open a, a short poll here and get your feedback. So if you think about either yourself or your sales managers, what are the greatest areas that you think they could improve or you know, maybe the greatest gaps that, that they have with this idea of accountability? So is it communicating the vision, establishing the performance expectations? Maybe it's focusing on the activities that are gonna drive the results that we're looking for. Maybe it's assessing the gaps and, and really understanding what the gaps in performance are or taking the appropriate action or ultimately, are we following up, right, once we've identified what those issues are? I think we're going to get some really interesting uh, responses here, Norman, but uh, I don't know. It's hard to pick just one. Uh, from well, a I think Anne kind of beat us to the quick here. I think she wrote all of them, fought, you know, so that was kind of interesting. And they are all important, but it really be interesting. We ask this in our workshop all the time. Uh, there are no right or wrong answers. It could vary from uh, organization to organization. But clearly, there are lots of rooms for improvement and would love to just kind of see, you know, personally, I think sometimes managers um, don't take action soon enough. They kind of take action in respond to a miss on results. And I think that, you know, that's really focusing and kind of managing with the rear view mirror. And what we really want to do is get people to really focus on, we know kind of whether we're tre trending towards hitting the results or not hitting the results much earlier, let's say if you're a quarterly driven company earlier in the quarter. So I think sometimes managers sit on their hands a little bit, either they don't want to take the action or they aren't sure what action to take. So they kind of just watch this miss happen as opposed to really trying to get proactive with their team and, and address that. So again, I'm really curious like you to see you know, what our participants think in terms of the greatest areas for improvement. Yeah, so I'll share the results here. I, I think it is interesting because we have a pretty big split and I, I like the fact, I mean, we're starting with establishing clear performance expectations, about a quarter of the audience, and then 30% focusing on the activities that drive results and 30% assessing the, the causes of performance gaps. And then the others kind of follow along with that. But I think it's so important to think about, have we set the expectations? Because what we know from a lot of the re industry research is managers feel like they've set expectations, but when we ask our reps, do they feel like those are clear, they've been communicated, they understand like, well, it's kind of fuzzy, it's changing, I'm not really sure. So there's some disconnect there, but I think the audience identified that, that it really has pretty good split between setting expectations, managing the activities that we're looking for and assessing the reason if there's a gap in performance, why is that happening? So I'm gonna stop sharing the results here just for uh, uh, and close that out. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about that, right? So when we talk about setting those expectations and, and managing their performance, I'd like to just introduce uh, some, some terms here that when we think about results, those are the things that we're going to measure at the end of the day or you know, the, the outcomes that we're looking for. And obviously, that's important. We got to hit our number. We got to close the business at the end of the quarter, the end of the year. Um, and those are typically pretty easy to measure. But if we think about the behaviors, those are the observable actions that are gonna achieve the results. Norman, maybe you could comment on that. I mean, yeah. how do you see that distinction? I'll give two, two examples. So I think the results, if you're driving down the freeway, the results are a little bit like looking through the rear view mirror, something that's already happened. The team hit 90% of quota, the team hit 110% of quota. We had a 50, you know, we had a 57% win rate on our proposals. They're measurable outcomes. I kind of heard this example once before. If you think about using uh, your camera, something you could take a picture of. It's kind of a point in time, something that's measurable, something that really no one would really argue about. It's, a, it's just a statement of fact about something that's already happened. Whereas the behaviors to me are like looking forward if you're going out the freeway, out of the front uh, a windshield and then saying, okay, what are those actions? And those would be things that we could actually videotape. For example, people making prospecting calls, people working on a proposal, uh, people going to a trade show, people reconnecting with clients that did business last year. So I think about actions as being the leading indicators of results. And I think results just being 
purely results. So results are ultimately the most important thing in terms of achieving your goals, but you can't achieve 120% of quota by saying, I want to achieve 120% of quota. That's simply the motivation. What are those actions that are gonna actually lead to that overachievement? So again, I think about this idea of one being very measurable and finite, and the other one being much more something you could videotape, something where someone's taking an action that actually drives results. Yeah, I love that. And I think the idea that behaviors, we can see if we're off track and we can also help. That's where the coaching comes in, right? To identify where we may be able to improve or, or help those in real time, again, versus getting to the end of the quarter and say, well, why did we miss our number? Let's do better next time. That doesn't really give us much, uh, much to work on. So, you know, I'll give a, a very brief example and then love to get some feedback from the group as well. Um, you know, taking it to a, a exercise diet kind of health perspective, let's just say, for instance, I was trying to lose a few pounds, just for instance. Um, and if I step on the scale every Friday and I look at that scale and the scale's not moving, I could get really frustrating, right? That's an example of measuring the result that I'm looking for. It, am I losing weight or not? But if I looked at the behaviors, in other words, the leading indicators that are going to influence that result, now I'm able to say, well, am I eating healthy food and managing portions or you know, calories in, calories out, right? Am I doing those things that I need to? And am I burning calories through exercise or being active and moving? Those are things I can track day in and day out, the activities that are going to produce the results so that when I step on the scale, I'm more likely to actually see progress in the direction. And again, I think especially in this remote and hybrid world, we can see the dashboard, we can see the results, and we get to the sales meeting and we're frustrated because we're not there, but we're really not having the conversation as much around the behaviors we're looking for in those activities. Yeah, something I would add to that is, you know, many of our customer clients are using um, CRM systems, probably the most popular of those being Salesforce, uh, but you know, there's a number of other ones like Microsoft Dynamics on the market. In any event, they all have great measurement tools. And one of the you know, point, point, uh, piece of advice I would give is really thinking about on the dashboards, which ones are results, which ones are activities. And I know that we, when we look at our own pipeline internally, we look at our kind of what are the results. Results can be you know, percent of plan attainment, they could be win rates, but then we also look at the activities, you know, what kind of contact activity are we having? So I think in Salesforce, you have the ability to really Think about, or any CRM, measuring your results, measuring your activity levels, but drawing the distinction between the two is a really important concept so that we're not mixing and matching behaviors versus results. Yeah, absolutely. And so let's uh, just get some input from the group here. We'll do this as kind of a speed round, but love to get, you know, what are the results that are most important? So again, if we think about what you're measuring, uh, and I'm just going to type that in, what results are most important to your team? And that may seem like a very simple question, but you know, we, we always say less is more in this case. So are there a few things you're measuring? What at the, the highest level are important? What results are those uh, that you're really looking for from your sales team? I had a type one and two. I put a uh, pipeline growth as being one of those results you might look for. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's a good uh, predictor or leader, right? Are we getting the growth rate that we need? Um, Daniel mentioned bookings and recurring revenues. So I think that's great, right? At the end of the day, are we really getting the growth rate that we need? Um, I think it's Yadira mentions retention rate. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really interesting one, especially these days, right? Are we getting, are, are we retaining the top performers that we need? What else are you seeing here, Norman? Uh, well, I'm seeing, you know, what are the, so Sherry has a really interesting comment. She's kind of playing on the pipeline growth is what we need, but to get there, we need the call volume. So that really is going to lead to the second half of this question. Um, Philip's saying, I love the idea of the referral rates, sales, profit year over year. Those are all things hitting the targets, high ethics. I think that's really interesting in that, you know, that's just a, not everything's quantitative. Some things are qualitative, but those are the things we might be looking for. And so even if we think about something like ethics, what are the behaviors that drive those ethics? Maybe it's you know honesty, integrity. So let's take the second half of the questions, part two of the speed round. So based on the submissions, what are the activities that you're looking for that drive results? 
And I think this is where we can start to really focus on the behaviors and how we manage our sales teams. Yeah, so this is really interesting. If we think some of these examples like net recurring revenue or uh, the uh, you know sales at the end of the of the quarter, the profitability, right? What have we really thought about what those activities and behaviors are that are going to produce the results? So when I think about like pipeline growth, things that drive pipeline growth would be prospecting, uh, referrals into new accounts, deeper penetration within accounts, developing strategies to, to really drive new business or to map accounts uh, to really understand if there's other opportunities within accounts. Um, the customer experience, great. So the customer experience drives retention. Great, great example. I'm looking at a couple other examples here. Uh, Quality interactions with customers, you know, so are we adding value during the sales process? So that really gets to coaching. Are we able to really coach around specific selling skills where sales reps are not only presenting solutions, but they're presenting solutions in a way that they add value by really aligning with the with the customer's needs? Ray, your thoughts? Yeah, we've got a great group here today. You know, some like Sotos mentions cross or upselling. And I'd say, okay, so are we seeing the behaviors? In other words, are we extending our deals to include those things? Are we having meetings with others in the organization? That's a leading indicator we can look to. Have we mapped the organization? How many meetings either with key executives or with other departments are we having? That's gonna tell us, are we on track to, to hit that target? Uh, LJ mentions interaction volume, uh, the, mm -hmm. the quality of the discussion. So some of these are gonna be more qualitative, but it's not just number of meetings. Are we having good meetings, right? Are, are they quality? The only way you know that is either listen to the recording, sit in on that as a, as a ride along, or you know, observe those coaching behaviors that we're trying to get to, uh, to see if we're actually doing what, what we hope they're doing in terms of the quality of those meetings. And those quality meetings are absolutely drive uh, pipeline growth. When we have quality interactions with customers, we create interest. I think the point in the chat was create value we can create value in those interactions, it's a pretty good bet that that will lead to uh, a pipeline growth. So really nice interaction. I think everyone's kind of got this concept of results. Those are what we're really striving to achieve. Activities, those are the behaviors that drive those results. Absolutely. And as we encourage, and, and even in our workshops, I think one of the activities that really brings us to life is when we're forced to break it down to two or three of those key results we're looking for, and then what are the behaviors that are uh, going to produce it? So even if there's a dashboard, there's a wealth of information, but can we break it down to a few things that everybody knows? Oh, yeah, these are our key leading indicators that we're looking for. So when we think about the next areas, you know, let's say we've defined what behaviors we're looking for. Maybe that's more prospecting, more quality interactions with our customers. We start thinking about those activities. Then we look at those activities. Are we able to really assess the causes? What's you know, if there is a deficiency, what's going on here? What's, what's the underlying cause? So how do we actually diagnose what's happening? And obviously if there's a performance gain, are we able to achieve that as well? And so just to take, kind of move one slide forward, you'll see this concept of, you know, clear communications. And I think this is one of the areas where it really starts with the manager because it should include the desired results. So what is that specific result we're, we're looking to achieve? What are the behaviors required? That's what we just spent some time doing as a group. What are the behaviors that drive those results? How, what are the metrics? How are we gonna assess whether those behaviors are actually happening? And what's the time frame? So Ray, I sometimes refer to these as the four elements. Can you just expand on that? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things again of have we clearly defined what we're looking for and done it in a way of, you know, people use smart goals and other things, but in a way that people know if they're on track or not. And the frustrating thing I think for reps is, well, I'm not really sure how we're assessing that, or I don't know if I'm doing a good job. So I think, you know, if there's a gap in performance, I always like to ask first, have we clearly defined and set those expectations? Have we communicated? And it's interesting when we pull that back a little bit, we often get the, well, I thought I did, but maybe, maybe I haven't, maybe I need to reset. Maybe I need to go have a conversation the best way to know if we've communicated that well is that they can communicate or explain it back. Like, here's my expectation, or they can send an email and say, yes, 
these are the three things I'm going to focus on. So there's no, uh, no guesswork or misinterpretation there. The other point I would add to that, Ray, is the point you made earlier that it, even though this does come across as being a little bit of a directive, it really should be in the, in the um, spirit of a performance partnership. So the idea of actually getting feedback from the sales rep. So are we, you know, let me just kind of get your perspective on that result. Does that seem reasonable? So if that's the result we're achieving for, you know, what are those activities? You know, some of the ideas that we, you know, get their ideas maybe first, really then focus in and lean in on those behaviors that actually will help achieve those results. So does it seem reasonable then that we could go from X to Y in terms of our prospecting activity? And then, you know, why don't we check back together over a month, but make sure it's a uh, a performance partnership, because I think that sometimes managers get, they they almost get way too directive. But if you, if it's purely directive without the spirit of a performance partnership and buy-in, we're still likely not to achieve those goals because we may get some head nods or, you know, some kind, kind of, yeah, that, that makes sense, but really not the level of buy-in we actually need to achieve the goal. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, the worst is they, they're giving the nodding, but in the back of their mind, they're thinking, well, no, that's not going to work. You know, I don't really buy into that. But, but really, the results are not debatable, right? The organization has a goal, a target. And now we can say, okay, well, then how are we going to get there? How can we work together? How can I enable you to be successful? I think that's where the collaborative discussion really gets valuable. So let's look at examples of this. And maybe you could take us through this, Norman, in terms of when we have a gain, or when we have a gap. So if we're exceeding or maybe they're not doing what we're looking for. So I think this is a really important idea because whenever we think about managing sales performance, at least I think for most of us, our mind wanders to underperformance. But if I think about the great coaches, they play to people's strengths. And even if there are a lot of gaps, we're always better to recognize some of the gains things, things that people are doing better than you would have expected. So I like the fact that on this chart, we always start with the gains first, things that people are doing better than they expected. Maybe they're getting more meetings with new clients. Maybe they develop strategic account plans to, to grow accounts. I was working with a client yesterday where the idea was to map the accounts and get higher level access and really expand the footprint within accounts. It was a large software company that was kind of had this goal that we, we, can, we can create more value for our clients. If we sell higher up within the organization. So we want to recognize and we want to reinforce the performance gains. And I think that just creates the right spirit. It also gives people recognition for hard work and doing things well. Unfortunately, there's always going to be some performance gaps. Maybe the contact activity is too low. Maybe the quality of the conversations isn't what it needs to be. Maybe we're getting pigeonholed selling to lower level influencers and maybe we can't get to the key decision makers. So there are areas we want to improve. So we want to look at the gains. We also want to look at the gaps. We want to reinforce the gains. Not that difficult. We can empower people. We have good conversations. Maybe we can suggest they mentor other people or take a small portion of the sales meeting to explain what they're doing. But where it becomes more challenging is how do we improve performance? And I think this next uh, slide has a really nice illustration uh, of yeah. that. And I just, before we move off of this, just reiterate that I think we often forget to celebrate the successes and sure. point out those things they're doing right. And you know, the idea that uh, four out of five or you know, eight out of 10 of our conversations, we should be celebrating what's going right and looking for those opportunities. I, I joke, you know, catch them doing something right. Let's make sure they continue that, and especially these days where maybe they're working hard by themselves. They're not getting a lot of feedback. You're not able to go over and you know, uh, congratulate them on that deal. But let's make sure we're really reinforced what we want them to continue to do and celebrate that with the team so everybody sees that and then focus on those couple of gaps that we can help address. So I want to add one more point to that, Ray, as well, because you mentioned the, the ratio. And I think there was a study in Harvard Business Review that uh, people respond best to 80 percent positive feedback and 20 percent you know, areas for improvement. But I think if we just think about our culture and the ratio in sales that we use, my sense is it's not 80% positive feedback, 20%. So even though when we talk about managing sales performance, we're going to talk a lot about how do you really work through performance gaps. Keep in mind the ratio that Ray, Ray shared. Try and see if you get close to 80% positive feedback, play to their strengths. The other benefit of that is when you do that, they're going to be coming much more receptive if there is a gap. Absolutely. And even then, they remember the negative conversations 
a lot more, right? So I think that's why we have to err in, in that direction is those are the ones that they go home grumbling about even though you may have uh, talked about the, the valuable and proof. And that's probably even more true in a hybrid world where you're not actually in the office where they can't necessarily read all the facial tones all the time. But this is a really uh, important concept in that the idea between the presenting issue and a gap and the real issue. So if you think about you know this, this image of the iceberg, as a manager, we need to do a little bit of investigative work. You know, I use a personal example. If I came home and my spouse said, yeah, I'm doing fine. Well, that doesn't mean they're really doing fine. You know, you'd want to kind of ask a couple of questions. There are probably some things going on there we'd want to better understand. So causes are kind of what's underlying reasons. So let's say win rates are low, as an example. Well, what's really going on? Why are the win rates low? What's the underlying reason? It's also not simple. There could be multiple reasons, particularly as we think about the hybrid world, the challenges people have. There can be personal and professional reasons. Obviously, as um, managers, we want to focus on the business areas. If there are other areas that we need help on from HR, we may want to get some advice. But we want to understand what's going on. So if there is a miss on any of the results, what are the underlying reasons for that? Is it a skill issue? Is it a motivation issue? Um, and again, understanding there's typically going to be one or more causes. People are uh, not like machines. Before this call, I got a call from uh, the auto shop about my car. There was more than one thing wrong with it. It's going to cost a little bit more than expected to repair, but at least they're going in and they're diagnosing what are the underlying causes. And I think that's important that we take the time to have that dialogue and really investigate what's going on so we can help cure, um, you know, my partner, David, who works close with Ray and I often use the case if I, you know, middle-aged uh, male go to the doctor and I'm complaining uh, about severe pain in my chest and left arm, he's going to diagnose and ask a lot of questions. There's probably something more serious going on there than just a, a sore left arm. Right. Understanding the the root cause and, and maybe asking those next level questions. And I think as sales managers, you know, often, uh, many of us grew up as salespeople, right? So they were top performers, they got promoted. We've had that discussion. Maybe they don't have the, the skills and the training to be successful, but it's easy to jump to a conclusion and say, well, there's a gap. I know what's wrong. We need to fix it. And I think we see that often in our workshops where managers are quick to jump in and trying to fix. And maybe they haven't diagnosed first. They really haven't understood, oh, there's some personal issues going on. Maybe I haven't given them feedback as clearly as I should have. Maybe there's something blocking or getting in the way. So I think there are a number of things we want to understand first before we put a plan of action, right? A diagnosis and a treatment plan. So I would, I would just add to that one important point. So I think as managers, we have a lot of experience. We sold ourselves. Maybe we've been managing for several years. So we can jump to conclusions. But let's say we, even if we know we're absolutely right what the underlying cause is, so sometimes I'm sure I'm, under, I'm absolutely right only to find out I'm wrong, but let's just assume for argument's sake that I'm absolutely uh, convinced that I'm right on the underlying cause. It's still important to have the conversation because you want your salesperson to, sit, to articulate it themselves. If they articulate it themselves, they're gonna own trying to fix it. If they're simply being told what's wrong by their manager, they're likely to be more defensive and we won't have the performance partnership. And maybe most importantly, our success rate goes down. So even if you're certain as a manager what the underlying cause is, it's still worth taking the time to have the conversation, to have the salesperson really express it in their own words and take a little bit more ownership. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we had a question in the chat, and I don't know if it's uh, Georges or Jorge's, but mm -hmm. apologize. But the question was about performance face to face versus Zoom meetings. Uh, and does that change the, the strategy for gains and gaps? And at a foundational level, we believe that the fundamental skills really cross over. So the good questions and really understanding the problem before we present a solution, those are the things we can coach on. And we should identify what are those things we're looking for. But I guess to, to just put a finer point on it, we really need for our own team to identify what are the results we're looking for. And now in today's world, hybrid or whatever that looks like, what are those activities and behaviors we're looking for that are gonna produce the results? Nobody can give you a formula or answer that question. You need to look at it 
relative to your own clients and your own situation. Now, I would add one point on the question. It's a really great question. On Zoom, when you're going to have a performance conversation, I wouldn't do it ad hoc. I would schedule time and have at least 30 minutes and have a scheduled time where you can have a quality conversation. There's nothing worse as a sales rep than getting feedback and the manager saying, I've got to jump to another meeting. So I would say the one distinction between in person, even in person, you, you're, you're tempted to spend more time. You can kind of read the room. If you're going to have a conversation about performance, which is something you should be doing ongoing, uh, we recommend one-on-one -on -one meetings every week and blocking out minimally 30 minutes, ideally 45 minutes for a weekly one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Do it in the context where there's really time to have a discussion, not when you're rushing, you're aggravated by something, you just want to point it out and move on. It may feel good that you're kind of getting it off your to-do list, but are you really moving the ball forward and, and helping find an answer? No, I think it's so important. And, you know, I think uh, many sales organizations have spent time improving their virtual, you know, uh, visibility, their skills in the virtual environment, uh, even the look and feel of, of how they're coming across. We need to apply that to our team as well and think about our salespeople as our customers, right, of the manager, which means if we're having that sensitive one-on-one, -on -one, we should turn our camera on, we should limit the disruptions, we should really treat that as a very personal conversation as opposed to, oh, we're checking email and we're doing other things at the same time. So I think we should make that a priority and really apply those same skills that we've learned in the virtual selling to managing our virtual team. All right, well, let's continue on here. I know we want to take some questions and have time at the end, but once we've diagnosed or we've understood what those gaps and, and the reasons behind those, we want to take appropriate actions based on what we've identified. So again, if we haven't set expectations, maybe it's a training issue, maybe something's getting in the way, uh, but we should really understand the root cause. And then there are a number of different actions we can take uh, to address that. So maybe it is we need more training and coaching Maybe it's more of a motivation or attitude issue. So we need to think about performance counseling. Uh, maybe it's a newer rep and we just need to be a little bit more directive until they've gotten to a point where they can stand on their own. So we need to show them what good looks like and provide them a little bit more guidance. So, you know, these uh, all come into play, but at the end of the flow chart, if you will, we need to understand, are they really a good fit? Maybe there are a number of gaps. We've tried all the other uh, approaches but maybe they're not a good fit and we should re think about reassignment or something else. So, um, you know, there are a number of different actions we can take. And I think we should really think about the appropriate action or actions uh, that are gonna address that need. So let me just ask when we think about the actions that they can take, what are most challenging for your team? So I'll go back to the other slide, but again, love to get in the chat here. What do you find is most challenging uh, which actions uh, are most challenging for the managers to take? I think it's a really interesting question. I think we hear so much about coaching, but you know, as we look at the list of potential management actions, there's a lot of different actions managers can take. So it'd be really interesting to just kind of get some perspective and understanding, you know, within your own organization, what are which which ones of these are probably the most challenging for your for your frontline managers? And, you know, Ray, I'll give a little bit of my own personal opinion. I think that um, coaching is challenging. I think that the reason is it takes us the ability to know how to coach and making sure you have the time to coach, seeing some really interesting answers, inadequate coaching coming up, kind of the point I was making. I think Christian is also, or Christina is also bringing up coaching. Performance counseling was brought up very hard to have performance counseling, to have those conversations. Yeah, I would add to that, uh, Norman, you know, I think on performance counseling, because that may get into attitude, motivation, maybe there are personal issues going on. And we define that that's different than coaching, right? Coaching mm -hmm. is, hey, let's identify some skills, or maybe it's deal coaching, and we can have a collaborative conversation. But if there's really something getting in the way of them making an effort, uh, we really need to take a step back. And maybe we want to involve HR uh, you know, maybe we have an HR partner we can engage. Maybe they need to think about an <clears throat> improvement plan or something beyond, but it may be a personal issue that we need to understand. No amount of training or coaching 
may be able to get past that. So I think we do need to be really sensitive to that and treat it really as a separate intervention. I think that's that's spot on. I think when we think about coaching, we're really talking about helping people improve skills that could be selling skills, uh, whether it's related to you know creating value, asking better questions, learning how to negotiate. Those would be types of skills. Also opportunity coaching, helping them advance opportunities within their pipeline. Performance counseling typically isn't so much skill related, uh, they may have the skills, it really gets more to attitude and motivation. So when you think about the distinction between coaching and performance uh, counseling, kind of a first lens might be, is it more of a skill issue or is it more of an attitude or motivation issue? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, several comments about coaching in here as well. Um, Christina mentions micromanaging mm -hmm. uh, or not providing as much. And I think that's a that is a fine line of either people want to just say, well, do it my way or do it. This, this is the way I did it, which really isn't coaching. That's more directing, but coaching, we do want to make it more collaborative and we want to make time for it. And so that is a skill that needs to be developed and fostered and really say, okay, how can we work together to improve this skill? And I think that's what LJ's point of, you know, what does good coaching look like um, versus just do it my way uh, and then following through. So having those conversations. Uh, Sherry mentions directing. So sometimes we do need to be more directive saying, no, this is the policy, but you know, delivering it in a way that we get give very clear guidance. So I think you know, all of these can, can come up. We should certainly consider when they're most important. And I'd say you know, we didn't see it, but even empowering, you know, when is it important to say, this person's ready, let them stand on their own Maybe they can train and empower others and, and be the example. So I think that's really uh, an, an important one as well. That's where we'd like people to get, right, is where they're empowered to stand on their own. And, and absolutely, when you see those performance gains, again, we're spending a lot of time on the gaps because gaps are more challenging to manage. But when you see those performance gains, you definitely want to focus on empowerment. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, let's talk about bringing this all together and thinking about uh, how it comes uh, you know, how, how we can help our managers be more successful and maybe implement some of these. So, you know, especially in this hybrid world, we believe that taking a blended approach to training, just like we're taking a blended approach or, or a hybrid approach to our selling and to managing our teams, um, we can do that as a way of implementing the digital solution. So, you know, we've gone through their challenges that we're up against, we're trying to establish priorities, set expectations, manage, understand the causes and manage the gains and the gaps and take the appropriate actions. What we'd like to do is really help our managers understand that. So when we think about delivering training in this world, we kind of went from almost purely ILT or a lot of organizations were really focused on instructor-led in-person workshops. Maybe they made a pivot to virtual uh, during the pandemic or at least using more virtual. Uh, but, and that obviously has trade-offs. Maybe there's some e-learning or micro-learning videos that could come into play. But what we've seen evolved and, and very successfully is more of a digital blend where we flip the classroom, we're using some training in advance, we're using interactions, and, and we'll talk about that collaboration along the way, and using that as a way of training our team. So we just wanted to make the transition to say, well, if we are setting a framework for managing that hybrid team, how do we support and enable our managers to be more effective and train them in that world? And I think that's really important in that the managers, the traditional uh, ways of uh, development, while the content may not have changed uh, all that much, although I think it has changed some just based on managing hybrid teams, the managers are also for the most part working remotely. So we have to have new strategies to reach them and to create learning journeys where they can participate uh, you know, with a combination of self-paced and instructor-led uh, training to really create that level of collaboration. And Ray, I think you have a really good image of what those elements are. Yeah, so we'll just uh, kind of walk through briefly. And again, I want to be sensitive to our time here, but what we've um, really termed and defined as the collaborative learning experience, so the CLX platform, and what that does is it brings together a mixture of uh, the micro-learning, the e-learning uh, activities, uh, that they can take at their own pace. So that's asynchronous. And then coupling that with a uh, virtual instructor led, so cohort sessions. And so going through and we use a platform that supports this, 
they can apply what they've learned to real activities, field work, missions, and even bringing in participant videos, so their, their own application and those of others. So they're learning from each other, and then they can have discussions uh, and live sessions where they're really talking about the application. And in my mind, that blended approach of they're getting the content, they're applying it, and then they're discussing it is really a game changer because you can see the work that's being done. They can share lessons with each other. And even compared to a live in-person workshop, they may only get you know, 10 or 15 minutes for an activity, but here they can go back and they can reference and they can see the, the best practices and share with each other. So then they get access to the tools and you know, they're tracking along the way where they see how they're doing relative to the team. And so we've kind of made a shift right, from what it is to train to how it is to train the managers. And we think this is a very successful way to really enable them to be better managers in this hybrid world. And I think the, what we've found, you know, so we've also, we've all learned a lot through, you know, as we kind of worked through the uh, whole pandemic and getting back to where we are today, which is, I actually think this creates a better learning experience. So we kind of landed here, the trend was headed in this direction anyhow, but we landed here out of necessity but what we're finding with clients, and I was on a session yesterday, is just as Ray was saying, the quality of the work and the thought process that goes into the work and the collaboration is really outstanding. So we're seeing better skill application. And I think we we'll also use a lot of adoption tools. So I think people are walking away with something that's much more practical and also better fits their schedules in a hybrid world. Instead of being two days in a workshop, you know, 16 hours over a two day period, Contents metered out over a number of weeks. Typically, you know, takes about two to three hours per week, including a weekly cohort session with their peers. We have a little illustration. If you know, there's someone saying, "Well, what, what does this actually look like?" You know, today's topic was managing sales performance. I'll just share a visual on that. So, in a collaborative learning experience, they would land on, uh, you know, a user interface that looks like this. It, you know, it's kind of just very inviting. You can click almost anywhere. There's a leaderboard. And then when you start to unfold it, you can see that the content is actually chunked out. So there's usually a welcome session and then, you know, manage your team's performance, setting expectations, some of the key topics we've talked about today. And there are content tiles where they get content, there are video micro learnings, and most importantly, there are missions and assignments. And again, so there's, again, this program like this might be metered out over three weeks. Actually, we're offering this, I think Alonzo will say this as kind of a uh, standalone course tying to today. It's a great opportunity to try it. Uh, if it's something you're interested in, I just wanted to share with you kind of what it looks like. I think sometimes people are saying, well, collaborative learning, that's an interesting concept, or, you know, we have a digital initiative and we want a digital learning journey, but they're really not sure what it looks like. But if you think about this with combined with weekly or biweekly um, cohort sessions, it creates a really nice, nice experience. And I think there's just one more illustration that kind of shows that learning path. So this would be like for you know an, an entire program, like our high impact sales manager program, of which you can see managing sales performance sits in the middle, but it could sit at the front, it could sit at the end. You basically create a learning path and clients create different learning paths. Maybe some clients want to do only sales coaching. Maybe some wants to do sales coaching or pipeline, you know, or today's topic, managing sales performance. But this just gives everyone kind of a visual of what these digital learning paths look like. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to uh, Ray and Alonzo. Maybe Ray can wrap up for us kind of on some key takeaways. And then I think Alonzo, Alonzo wanted just a couple of minutes with the group as well. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I think the idea of using a, a platform or environment that uh, really supports the hybrid world. So as we said, we're selling, we're managing, and actually we're delivering. Uh, there's lots that we can do in in that situation. So um, let me just cover, you know, we, we've covered a lot of ground here, but we talked about hybrid and remote teams being kind of the new normal, uh, wanting to create that customer uh, accountability and, and culture of accountability, focusing on the behaviors that drive the result, results and really understanding what's going on behind the scenes so we can address the gains and the gaps and then really pulling that together in a way that we can enable their team. So I know there are a few more comments and questions here, but Alonzo, just while we're sorting through those, let me turn it back over to you. Uh, I'd love for you to talk about uh, this offering that we have coming up that Norman mentioned, and then uh, we'll take a few uh, questions and comments at the end. Yeah, thank you, Ray. So 
Uh, I know some of you, uh, let me know that something that prompted you to register for this webinar was that you were looking for ways to support your sales managers. So we thought you would be interested in this upcoming Managing Sales Performance CLX workshop that we're running on December and it's now open for public enrollment. In this program, sales managers will, your sales managers will learn how to implement into their practice many of the things that we touched on on this webinar today. We going to be delivering this workshop through our collaborative experience, which as we were the digital learning and courses you're seeing here on those days. In this next slide, you can kind of get an idea of, uh, Ray, can you uh, switch to the next slide? On this next slide, you're going to get an idea of how throughout their learning journey, your managers will be supported by a sales management expert who acts as a coach during the weekly live online cohort sessions. Then the sales managers also are also engaged with a forum moderator who answers questions and shares best practices. So if you're interested in enrolling one or two of your sales managers, I'm, I'm dropping a link in the chat right now. Uh, just so that you can have access to this. And I'm going to also be including the link in this webinar's follow-up email with a copy of the recording slides. Then we're gonna be closing enrollment for this program on November 29th. So please make sure you note that somewhere just so that you don't run out of time before that closes. And finally, if you have a group of five or more participants, feel free to get in touch with us so that you can learn more about our private offerings. And uh, with that, uh, let's see if we have any questions and answers. Let's see, I haven't really checked the Q&A yet. So it looks like nobody has submitted any questions. Yeah, Most I'll just respond to one that, that came up ahead, along the right. line. Really had to do with uh, the type of collaborative learning and this e-learning. And I think it's really spot on. Again, Jorge mentioned uh, a lot of e-learning is uh, too much and not really efficient. And, you know, how can we use game simulation for transfer of knowledge and other things? And I think, at least if I understand the, the basis for that, we believe that micro learning, very short little nuggets of content is going to be the best way, especially for sales teams and sales managers to consume. So it's one or two concepts, it's delivered very discreetly, and then we have them apply it. And when they apply it, they're getting points or badges along the way. So there are activities that lead to completion we've seen so much competition around being at the top of the leaderboard, really completing the course, getting a Credly badge, which we use, which is a third party digital badge uh, that really improves the completion rates and the engagement. And so we found that to be very successful.